Okay. Good to see everybody. Nice weather. Nice weather. A year ago, uh, Kay gave me two fig trees for my birthday. I grew up with fig trees in our backyard, and Mother made fig preserves all the time. And so I kept saying, been saying for years, you know, I want to plant a couple of fig trees. And so we planted them, and of course, winter came, and they all died back. Both of them died back. And so I said, well, it was worth a try anyway. Now one of them's this tall, one of them's this tall. The tall one has about six little figs on it. So <laughs> I just feel so good about that. But anyway, updates on our other folks that I've been out of touch about, um, our prayer concerns. It's good to have our, our buddy Dale with us. He's looking mighty handsome this morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and David, we're glad to have you as well. Thank you, Gary. Anybody see God this week? I've seen him a lot of times in the last two weeks. I will share one thing that happened, and, and I, I know it's a medical thing, and Jan, you may, you and Mary Ann, you may know when John, you may know more about this than I do. I've never had it happen before <clears throat> with the other surgeries and I had, I'm sure it's the anesthetic, but they had me on the table and they, you know, I had, it seemed like everybody at UVA Medical was surrounding me. Um, anesthesiologist was holding a mask on me and he was telling me what was going to happen and everything. And so he said, he turned to his assistant and said, go ahead and start. So I said, well, I'll see you later. And he laughed. And then I'm, I'm looking up here at the ceiling. And you know how, those of you who've been through this, you know, just before you go under, weird things kind of happen in your head. You just feel kind of funny. Well, I wasn't dizzy or anything. And that started happening. But for about 20 seconds, I have had tinnitus in both of my ears for over 40 years. And for about 20 seconds, I had absolutely none. Absolutely none. I heard every word that people were saying all around me. Clearly as if they had been standing right at me. I did have a hearing aid on. But it was as pure sound as I've ever heard. And I cannot even remember when I experienced not having click, 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 clicks going on in my head. Never had that happen. And I think that was God's way of saying to me, it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just took it and went to sleep. <laughs> but that was the most unusual thing. It was, it was amazing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives. We look at briefly the life of your servant, Elisha, this morning. And we are absolutely overwhelmed by the way in which he just loved you so much and, the, and loved people so much that he could not stop sharing you with them. Help us to be like Elisha. Help us to be willing to step outside our comfort zones, to uh, put aside things that have held us back from being who we, you would have us to be in favor of following you. Please lead us in the direction that you would have us to go. Give us words to say when we have the opportunities to share our faith with others. Give us the wisdom to know what kinds of things to do or to say to those who are in need. And always give us the strength and courage to not just do it once or twice, but to do it without stopping, because that's what you do. You give us grace 24-7. And you never even turn away from it. And so we hold our hands to you, up to you, and turn our eyes heavenward and say, thank you, Lord. We love you for the fact that you love us so much that you hold back nothing, even your own son, that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. 
And so help us to be good stewards of that grace, to be good stewards of that abundant life, and to be willing and ready to show Christ to the world who desperately needs him as we share our faith willingly and unabashedly. We thank you for our answered prayers. All of us in this room have been the beneficiaries of that. And we know just how that means, what that means and how that feels. And so we ask that you might be especially near today to those on our prayer list, those who we bring in our hearts, and those who we may not know by name, but who we do know need you. Be with each one of those, those who are undergoing different kinds of medical uh, situations that your Holy Spirit might be near them in a very special way and give them comfort and give them peace. We ask for help and assistance for the caregivers because they give so much of themselves in the care of others. Be with our first responders and help them as they keep us safe. And be with so many others who unselfishly give of themselves and give of their lives that others might have a better life. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the journey on which you've set us. Continue to guide us, lead us, and help us to not uh, grow weary in our work and in our walk, but rather to gain strength from all the wonderful things that we know you're going to make happen here among us. Be with us as we study, open our hearts, but more importantly, open our minds for understanding that that understanding may feed our hearts and in turn, we might be able to speak knowingly and led by your spirit to others as we share your word with those who haven't heard it. So be with us as we worship, as we fellowship, as we study, as we pray. And it's in Jesus' name that we lift this prayer. Amen. First of all, going all the way back to my, my childhood days of going to Sunday school and um, Bible school and all the other things that kids in my, my generation and yours as well did over the years. And we heard stories from the Bible and I have always run into Elisha and I've always pronounced it Elisha. And so I was kind of looking for a video uh, that we might could use today, and I'll tell you why in just a second. And the first thing that happened, it was the, the um, announcer, the narrator uh, for the little video that I was, I was considering was British. <clears throat> and the first thing he did was he speaks of Elisa. And I thought, wait a minute, that can't be right. And he constantly did that, so I switched to another one. And the first mention is Elisa. And I thought, wait a minute, this can't be right. So I looked at pronunciations. And so we're on good ground with Elisha. But in particularly in the Jewish community, they do pronounce it Elisa. So if you hear that sometimes, that, that might help you. Well, why are we focusing on him? Our scripture comes from 2 Kings for two little verses, 42 through 44. We're going to be blessed with Gina Ray this morning. And I love, 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 love to hear her speak. She's so smart, so wise. And so when uh, Kay told me about that, I said, you know, I could go teach the lesson. She's going to be giving a wonderful sermon on exactly the same scripture. I said, that seems kind of redundant. There's not a whole lot more that I can think to add. And folks who listen, attend the service on uh on uh, YouTube or Facebook are going to be subjected to the same thing if they have listened here to this. So it dawned on me, maybe we need to get more context, which would maybe help us better understand what Gina is going to talk to us about. Not a cop-out, but I just thought for my own benefit, I thought it would just be really helpful. It's an interesting thing about Elijah and Elisha. Many, 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 many years ago, I led a study um, where we looked at the Old Testament. I mean, it was a survey 
I think it lasted about 10 weeks, something like that. Some of you may have attended and I can't remember. But there was a section in that when I wanted to focus on the prophets. <clears throat> and when you start looking at a study of the prophets, the first thing you learn is that they're divided into two groups. There are the major prophets and there are what are called uh, the minor prophets. So we think major prophet, does that mean they're the most important ones? And the minor prophets were those who just did their thing kind of in the background. Quite the opposite. The major prophets are so named because they have a book with their name on it in the Bible. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, right? all of those are considered major prophets. Minor prophets are so called because their books are much shorter than those of the major prophets. Now, does that make sense? It absolutely does not to me. Why designate major and minor? Why don't they just say the prophets? But then when you get to Elijah and, and, and Elisha, I'm going to say Elisa, uh, Elisha, you say, well, they're not listed here with the major or minor prophets. But my goodness, it's hard to get away from them. I mean, we read about people expecting, thinking Jesus may be as Elijah, John the Baptist may be Elijah. Someone with that kind of history has to be a major prophet. Well, they're only mentioned in a couple of books in the Bible. But thank goodness they are. And so when we talk about Elisha, he presents, in contrast to Elijah, I think some of the most amazing contrasts, but at the same time, some of the most beautiful ways in which God has used people to work with him to bring his people back to him. We first hear of Elisha back in the book of 1 Kings chapter, um, chapter 19. The Lord appears to Elijah. Elijah is coming toward the end of his period of service in his life. And God appears to him and says, <clears throat> a young man named Elisha is going to succeed you. Go and anoint him. So he does. Elisha is, was evidently, we don't know a whole lot about his early life, but evidently he was the son of a family that had a pretty prosperous farming operation. And so Elijah goes to him. You know this story. I love it. Elijah goes to him, and Elisha is out there in the field plowing behind oxen. And he calls to him and comes up to him, and um, he says, he puts his cloak on him and tells him, you know, you're next, buddy. I'm paraphrasing. But he basically lets him know that he is to be his successor. So Elisha does what I think most of us might do. He said, let me go and kiss my mother and father goodbye. And so Elijah says, okay. So he does that. But not only does he do that, he kills the oxen, sets fire to his plow, which was all wood, by the way. Sets fire to the plow and cooks the oxen on the fire. That is a symbolic way of leaving his that life and going to another life. In other words, he's burning his past and leaving it behind him. So we have here with Elisha another story that mirrors some of others who have similarly been called by God. Abraham comes to mind immediately. 
God called him and he said, wait a minute, I've got about, and I'll get back to you on this. I've got several things I've got to do and it's going to be at least about a month before I can do it. He said, no. He said, okay. And he went. Elisha does exactly, exactly the same thing. His name translates to God is my salvation. Isn't that neat? And when we see a little bit more about his life, when we see why he was so named and how he literally lived up to that name. First days of his ministry, he was probably a gopher for Elijah. Said that he poured the water for Elijah to wash his hands, you know, I guess to be uh, purified before he conducted rites or did different kinds of things. And he came to realize very quickly that his mentor, truthfully his surrogate father, was going to be leaving him soon. And as it turned out, the two of them started on a journey and they were heading down toward the Jordan Valley. And two or three times, Elijah turns to Elisha and tries to encourage him to just stay where he is and let him go on ahead. And Elisha refuses to leave him. He just stays right there with him. And then they finally stop and Elijah turns to Elisha. And he said, what is it that you would like of the Lord? And here is one of the most beautiful expressions of one who has completely given his whole life over to God and God's service. Listen to what he says. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. We pray, God, fill us with your spirit. This man is saying, give me a double dose. Give me a double dose of it. <laughs> Get me three times with it. Come on, keep pouring, keep pouring. Elijah says, well, you've asked a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. So they continue their walk. And as they're walking, all of a sudden, this chariot with horses, chariot of fire and horses of fire, appear and separate Elisha and Elijah, and as Elijah, Elisha watches, Elijah is taken up by a whirlwind and taken up into heaven. He turns to him and he says, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. I mean, he couldn't figure out what was going on. Scared him to death. I understand that. I would have done exactly the same thing. And then the scripture says he didn't see him anymore. He was gone. And then he tore his cloak into it. was a sign of deep, deep, deep grief and mourning. So he asked for a double portion of God's spirit, his Holy Spirit. And he comes to realize as he absolutely, as actually starts out on his journey as a full-fledged prophet exactly what that means one of the things that sets Elisha apart from all other prophets in the Old Testament is he is recognized as the prophet of miracles God worked through him in at least 16 different ways to perform miracles and it was so interesting because what we see unfolding here is not to say that Elijah, Elisha is greater than Elisha. Couldn't be farther from the truth. But what we see is a very sharp distinction that takes place between those two prophets. So let's look at it real, real quickly. Elijah was in the same mold as most of the new of the Old Testament prophets. He would go to people in different places 
and basically preach fire and brimstone and tell them you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. You need to draw back to your covenant relationship with God. You need to repent and return to God. And so as he went about doing that, that was his message time and time and time again. On the other hand, Elisha, largely through his miracles. Now he took times, as you, if you read it, he took times to dress people down pretty sharply for being so sinful. But what Elisha sought to do was to try to bring comfort to people who were suffering, people who were wandering and wandering through life because they had so many things that were just overwhelming them, health, money, all sorts of other kinds of things. He was a people prophet, in other words. Both Elijah and Elisha did most of their work in the northern kingdom. But Elisha was much more involved with the political affairs of the ruling elite. He was one who uh, knew them and they knew him and he mingled with them and had a really profound influence over time to the kings that were serving at various and sundry times. Elijah was a solitary prophet. He was one who sort of stayed unto himself and sort of was his own countenance. Very quiet person, evidently. Whereas Elisha, on the other hand, I kind of envision him as being very outgoing, much more personable. And he was a, a prophet of the people. He was one who wanted to be near them. And particularly, particularly, and I did not realize this. I guess I had read it, known it from somewhere way, way back. But at that time, at, all over the country, there were what were called communities of prophets. I would say they just simply were clergy, but whatever, communities of prophets. And they were doing pretty much what the other prophets were doing. And that is trying to serve them as they serve God, trying to bring them, keep them constant in their relationship with God and God's covenant with them. And what Elisha did was paid a great deal of attention to the health and care of those communities of prophets to encourage them, to keep them healthy, to keep them on task and working. Elijah was a harsh judge of Israel, as were most of those prophets. But again, Elisha was much more personable, even though he likewise was harsh many times in his criticism. And some of the prophecies that he provided were, quite frankly, just like daggers in the hearts of those that he was addressing. Elijah, <clears throat> according to scripture, only performed eight miracles. Elisha, 16 that we know of that were recorded. So what I want to do now is just simply highlight some of those miracles as a way of showing you what this man did as he served people. One of the most, one of the best known let me back up a little bit. Let me back up just a little bit. Right after Elijah ascended into heaven, he was taken into heaven, Elisha returns on the journey and is heading, making that, making that trek. And as he's going along there, he finds that the city has encountered a problem with poisoned water. Sounds familiar to some of the things we've been hearing about around here lately. So all the people say that there was a curse placed on the city. So he took salt and sprinkled it in the water, which released the curse. 
and the water was made palatable. So he continues on, and he's confronted by evidently a fairly large group of ruffians, young ruffians, and they threaten his life, and so he pronounces a curse on them, and this bear comes out and mauls and kills all of them. So well, that's sort of the start of his miracles, but whoa. But the widow and the oil is one that I remember so, 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 so well. Bible school one year, we had to go out and collect all kinds of different vessels. We had to go around the church. We were told if we want to bring something from home, we could. And we collected them and put them on tables down in the fellowship hall. And I don't know how many we had, a bunch of them anyway. And it was all to teach the story here of uh, Elisha and the miracle of the woman and the oil. <clears throat> Seems as though this widow became destitute after her husband had died. And she was being hounded by uh, the person who, to whom she owed a pretty good bit of money. And she was even at the point of having her children taken away from her and turned into soul or slavery. She had nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Here's the Bible school. Elisha told her to go and collect every vessel she could find. She did that and brought them. And he took the oil and filled them and filled them and filled them and filled them. There was so much oil that she was able to sell it and settle her debt. Now that's a compassionate, that's the compassionate way of doing it. That's what Jesus did. He approached someone in need. He saw the need and he didn't ask anything. He just took care of it. Then there's the story of the Shudamite woman. Evidently, Elisha in his travels, I'm sure he probably, if he kept a journal, he has had names of people all throughout his journey, all throughout his travels that he had encountered and had some kind of a relationship with them. But evidently with this Shunammite woman and her husband, they got to be really good friends. And their friendship was such that he became concerned because they could have no children and so he prayed for her, and sure enough, they had a son who grew up very healthy. He's working in the field one day and has a terrific headache and falls down dead. So the woman goes, and she doesn't know what else to do. He gets Elisha. He comes back, spreads his body out over the young man, and he comes back to life. All of you have heard that one, I'm sure. You're bound to have. And then there's the one of the poison soup. And this involves one of those communities of prophets that I was talking about. As he was going down into the Gil, into Gilgal, which is the one in the, the south, really closer to the south, it seemed as though there was a fairly vital group of a community of prophets working in that particular region. And so when he went there, he wanted to take time to have a meal with them and to do some teaching and help them, you know, to help them do better what they were called by God to do. And so he tells uh, the servant to prepare a pot and make some soup for them. And so the servant then goes out to collect some herbs, but he is not very familiar with all of the plants and things there in that area. And he collects some poisonous herbs. Uh, they're really called bitter apples or apples of Sodom. And brings it back to throw it into the soup bowl. But some of the members of that community of prophets recognized it and said, Ooh, that's poison. It'll kill you. So Elisha walks up and takes a handful of meal, sprinkles it on the soup, and it's edible. Then we get to what is often referred to simply as the feeding of the 100. And this is the scripture that uh, Gina is going to be speaking on today. So I'm not going to dwell on it a great deal. Just talk about it um, so that you can again have sort of the context for it. 
It opens up in the scripture with the appearance of an unknown man, but a man of God, one who worshiped God and who followed what God had told the people to do in relation to the covenant relationship. He was a very godly person. And during this particular period, uh, the people were, were required, the covenant people were required to bring a sacrifice of the first fruits of the barley harvest and give it as a sacrifice uh, for, for the, in the temple for the people. So this man appears with 20 loaves of bread. And Elisha's servant looks at it and says, we got a hundred people here. 20 loaves of bread is not going to do the job. And Elisha looks at him and said, God has sent a word to me that this is more than enough to feed everyone who's here. And in fact, there will be food left over. Sure enough, you can see the immediate parallel with Christ and the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. And in this particular one, I found a table that was created out of a, an article written by uh, Michael Hunt <clears throat> that gives a, a real interesting little comparison between uh, Elisha's feeding miracle and the feeding miracles of Jesus. And I think you could anticipate what those, what those were if they were there. And then we're going to talk just real quickly here. Finally, the, we could go through all 16 of them. They're, they're fascinating. This is the one that uh, has, a, has, has a double kind of thing going on with it. Referred to as the healing of Naaman. By now, at this point in uh, Elisha's ministry, he's become known throughout the region as a man of God and a man of miracles. And so he is attracted, a, a, a man named Naaman is attracted to him because he has contracted leprosy. He is a commander of an army of Syria, Aram, as it was called in those days. And so he comes to Elisha and he says, I know you're a man of God and that you have the ability to heal me of my leprosy. So Elisha tells him to go down and bathe in the River Jordan. Listen to the scripture. But Naaman went away angry, saying, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand there to call on the name of the Lord his God and would move his hand over the place and thus cure the leprous spot. Are not the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farfar, Farpar better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be cleansed? With this, he turned about in anger and left. And of course, Elisha is trying to teach him simply lessons in obedience. All you have to do is what I say. Just obey what I'm telling you to do, and you will be healed. And he wouldn't do it. But the larger story is, is that those who were there and hearing that, that's what God is asking us to do, is just simply obey what he has taught us and everything will be fine. It's not punitive. Far from it. His servants finally convinced Naaman that he needs to listen to this man of God. So he does what he tells him, and sure enough, goes down into the River Jordan, and he's completely cured. And he returns to Elisha and says, I want to give you a gift for what you have done for me. And Elisha, of course, refuses it. He said, no, that's, that's not necessary. So he leaves. Well, the plot thickens, as they say. Elisha had a servant named Gehazi, who was a pretty good guy. So he goes after Naaman and says, the master has changed his mind and he will accept your gift, blah, 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 blah. 
And so Naaman, of course, is delighted to be able to do that. So he gives him uh, money and clothing. <clears throat> Elisha says, where have you been? He lied to him and said, oh, I just went out. But then he told him exactly where he had been and what he had done. And then he places a curse on Gehazi and all of his family, said, you will be cursed with leprosy for the rest of your life. So that was it. One more little quickie. Working with that community of prophets, uh, they came to him and said, you know, we're, we need more living space. Can we cut some trees? Evidently, they owned the property, and uh, uh, Elisha was considered to be sort of uh, the head man for the whole, all of the prophets. So he said, sure, we can do it. And he said, I'll just even go and have lunch with you, and uh, I want to see what, what you've been able to do. And so as they're there, they're watching one of the one of the workers work with an axe that had a very expensive um, cutting head on it. And as he's chopping wood, the axe flies off and, and falls down into the river or the lake or into the river, I believe it was. And they say, oh, no, that was a very expensive axe head. And Elisha walks over and all of a sudden the axe head floats to the surface and they save it. So, you know, we can have a fun thing with Elisha's miracles. I say a fun thing because they're interesting. And I think for myself, sometimes when I read the Old Testament, the stories are intriguing. They really and truly are. And they're stories that uh, just sort of pique our interest. And so many times they pique our interest to the extent that they only become interesting reading and we miss the, le the, the lesson altogether. And for me, this is the case here with Elisha. He gave some final prophecies that all came to be true. And then he had one more miracle to give. He died and he's placed in the grave. And this group of, of people are out and they are burying a man in their community. And so they're about to be attacked. And so they just take the body of this man and throw it in on top of Elisha in his grave. The minute that they do that, the man comes back to life. So Elisha even was helping people from the grave. And I think that's the takeaway. I think that's the takeaway from, from this lesson. As much fun as it is to read about all of these things, Elisha never backed away from his calling. He never turned his back on God, and he continually, continually gave God all the praise and, and, the, and everything for everything that he did. And he worked with people, and by working with people, he worked through them and probably was much, much more effective in turning people back to God than was even Elijah and some of the more forceful fire and brimstone kinds of prophets. And so I think it's important for us to know that we may be small, we may not have a whole lot, we may not think that we even have the, the ability to do some different kinds of things for God. But we should never back away from the possibility he is going to call us. And I'm looking at people in this room who know that and have accepted that. But I think that's so very important as we have opportunity to share scriptures like this with people who have not read it or who have read it and maybe got some kind of a different kind of look at it. Oh, that's just a fairy tale. A broad axe head doesn't just float to the surface of a river. Fairy tales, legends, don't have any meaning at all. Entertaining, yeah. A teenage boy goes out and kills a giant. No, no way. No way. Impossible. But the lesson is, what we think of as being impossible is routine for God. What we think of as impossible is something that's going to perhaps turn around the life of an individual 
who's overcome with certain kinds of difficulties that we cannot even imagine. And I saw, I was trying to come up with a benediction. And it just dawned on me, one of the best benedictions I think I can offer us is the first verse from a hymn that we all know, that we've sung many, many times. Master, thou callest, I gladly obey. Only direct me, and I'll find thy way. Teach me the mission appointed for me. What is my labor, and where it shall be? Master, thou callest, and this I reply, ready and willing, Lord, here am I. And I think that's the, that's the lesson. That's what we're to take away from this. Thank you all. Love you. Look forward to seeing you next Thank you very much, Gary. You're very welcome. <clears throat> it's good to see you. We hope to see you soon. Hope to see you again next week. I'll be there. <laughs> David, you have a good week. You do the same. All of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.